Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll give our attention again to God's word in 1 Samuel chapter 3. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call, go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again the Lord called, Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel a third time, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go and lie down, and if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. This is God's word. Dear brothers and sisters, my office at home is just about 15 feet away from our bonus room, where our kids play video games and indoor basketball and wrestle and make other loud noises in the usual and unusual ways. So my, my ritual on Saturday mornings is, is to put these earplugs in when I sit down to write my sermon. And they, they really bring down the decibels quite well. But I'm not really so, so sure how well they work overall. Because it doesn't stop the kids from, from calling from the other room and, and knocking on my door, which, which puts me in a, in a place where I have to make a decision. Uh, do, I, do I just keep the earplugs in and say, hey, talk louder, I have earplugs in, or take out the earplugs and then put them back in until the next time they knock on the door? The, the other thing about, about earplugs is, is that they, they tune out the, the higher frequencies and that makes it a whole lot more difficult to determine who's talking. So, like, is, is that my wife calling or is that my nine-year-old? Now, now, Samuel didn't have earplugs in when he was lying down in the, in the temple of the Lord, um, but he was experiencing a similar communication breakdown. Who's, who's talking to me? And, and you can't blame him. If... If you were trying to sleep at night and you heard somebody calling your name, would your, would your first thought be, oh, must be God calling me? Or would you be guessing that's the person that's lying down in the room next door? Even more so in light of what it says in the first verse. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. There's a lot packed in, a lot of history packed into that line. So if you would, zoom out from 1 Samuel 3 with me a little bit. Samuel, he lived at the end of the period of the Judges, which was the, the Wild West era of Israel's history. Lawlessness abounds. Moses had brought the Israelites from Egypt up to the edge of Canaan, and then from, from there Joshua took over, and Joshua led the conquest of the land. So, so finally, 500 years after God had first promised Abraham that your descendants will possess this land, it was, it was theirs. That's the beginning of Judges. And that's when everything goes to pot. If you wonder what I'm talking about, read Judges. If you're going to read it with your kids, parental guidance suggested. The book is full of, of, of this cycle of the Israelites turning away from God and then God calling the Israelites back to him. And every time they go through that cycle, it gets worse. The further you read in Judges, the, the further the Israelites have descended into the sewer. 
to give you an example, toward the end of the book, there's a, there's a guy who thinks that the best way to achieve political unity in Israel is to chop up a corpse into 12 pieces and send it to every corner of Israel. And if that sounds disturbing to you, then maybe this makes it even worse. It worked. People loved it. Israel just descends further and further into the sewer. The, the recurring phrase in Judges is this. Everyone did as they saw fit. The Israelites, they were willing to talk about God all day long, about how awesome he was. But they were talking. They weren't listening. So you know what God did? He stopped talking. Sometimes the most severe punishment God can meet out on a person is to give them exactly what they want. There, there were some bright lights, though, in this dark age of Israel. For example, there was a woman named Hannah. Hannah prayed to God again and again that God would give her a son. And then when God answered her prayer and gave her Samuel, she was so thankful that she gave him back to God. When Samuel was a preschooler, she took Samuel to God's house to stay. And now we're zooming back into to the first verse of, of 1 Samuel chapter 3. In those days, and, and the boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli the priest. Samuel was a full-time worker at the temple. And as Samuel got older, uh, he became more and more of Eli's right-hand man. Eli needed the help. Eli had two sons named Hophni and Phinehas. They were also priests, but they weren't much help. They had descended down into the sewer just like pretty, pretty much everybody else in Israel. When, when people would bring uh, sacrifices to the temple, Hophni and Phinehas, they would just steal the meat for themselves. They fornicated with the women who worked at the temple. Eli knew about it. He knew what they were doing, and he, and he told them to stop. Well, but that's as far as Eli was willing to go. And Hophni and Phinehas, they knew it, that their dad was just all bark and no bite. So they just, he, he, they just kept on doing it, and Eli just kind of watched as they kept on doing it. Easier to work with Samuel than the two of them. That's why Samuel is, is sleeping in the temple by the ark of God. Eli is growing old. He's getting fat. He's going blind. So Eli gives Samuel the, the night shift in tending to the lamp of God at the temple. So that's what we read. It's a kind of a cute story on its surface. Samuel's lying there, and he, and he, he hears his voice. Uh, he obviously thinks that it's Eli and goes to Eli, and Eli's like, I didn't call you. Go back, go back and lie down. So Samuel, he's got to be scratching his head, and he, he goes back and, and lies down. And then he hears his name again, Samuel. And he's got to be thinking at this point, well, there's only two people here. So, so either I'm hearing voices or maybe Eli's calling me. So he goes back and he, and he checks in with Eli again. And uh, if, if you're a parent who's ever had uh, kids that have had a rough night, you probably know how Eli felt. So Samuel goes back to his room again. But then when it happens the third time, that Eli is starting to wise up as to what's going on. And he, he says, Samuel, go back and lie down. And if you hear the voice again, this time say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Samuel goes back and lies down a fourth time, and, and he hears the voice again, and that's how he responds. And, and that's how this, this line of communication between God and Samuel is established. It's a, it's a cute story on its surface, but the story doesn't end at the end of verse 10. I'd like to tell you about what happens in the rest of the chapter. After Samuel says, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. God spells out for Samuel his impending judgment 
on Eli and Hophni and Phinehas. Hophni and Phinehas, they were marching God's people further and further away from God, and Eli was just letting them do it, all bark, no bite. So God says to little boy Samuel, he tells him, I'm going to cut Eli and his family off from the priesthood, and I am going to cut short their lives. They weren't serving God anyway, so God was going to make it official. When Samuel said, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening, I bet he wasn't expecting God to tell him that. He's about 12 years old. So how do you think he feels the next morning when Eli asks him, um, Hey, Samuel, what did, what did God tell you last night? I wonder if Samuel's thinking, I, I, I wish I would never have listened. He's scared to tell Eli. You can understand. Eli has to pry it out of him. In my work as a pastor, it happens somewhat frequently that people will tell me that God talks to them. And not just talking through their Bible, but talking to them directly, like Samuel. I have no doubt at all about God's ability to do that. Bible's full of examples, like Samuel. But I am generally skeptical. For one, it has never been God's habit to speak directly to people as his normal means of communication. Never. In the Old Testament, God would always, always point people to the prophets. Listen to them, prophets, like, um, like Samuel. God would reveal his, his message to the prophets. The prophets would relay the message to the people, ultimately by writing it down. That's where the Bible came from. Here, God has a message for Eli, but he doesn't give it directly to Eli. He gives it to Samuel, who's going to be his prophet. That was his first job as a prophet. It it causes me great concern to hear so many high-profile pastors making claims that God has this direct line of communication with them, uh, and then um, often even implying that, that really all Christians should expect to hear from God directly, um, sometimes going so far as to give the impression that if you're a Christian and you're not hearing God speaking directly into your ear or directly into your heart, well, maybe there's something wrong with your faith. Maybe you're not really a Christian. It gives me pause because that has never really been God's thing. In the Old Testament, he spoke through the prophets. Listen to them. In the New Testament, he points people to the Bible. Listen to my word in the Bible. And that way, it eliminates a lot of confusion and doubt. You don't have to wonder whether what you're hearing is what God is saying or whether it's just your imagination or maybe even a much darker force talking to you. And that way, we're all on the same page. Everybody's getting the same message. If parents send their kids to bed, and 15 minutes later, the kids come downstairs saying, uh, sorry, Mom and Dad, but when we were upstairs, God told us that we should disobey you and that he wants us to watch TV and eat junk food all night. Well, parents can tell their kids, well, I don't think so, because God says in the Bible that you should obey your parents. And they don't have to have a single qualm or hesitation. Well, that maybe they're standing in the way of the will of God. I'm, I'm, I'm very glad that God doesn't, doesn't just talk to Christians one by one. Number one, what would that mean if I never heard God talking to me? I might just figure that, well, maybe God doesn't have anything to say to me. Maybe, maybe he doesn't care about me. And number two, if that's the way that God communicated with me, and just me, that would present me with an awful big temptation to use 
God's voice to justify my own wickedness. Um, you know, I would really be love to be generous, but, but God told me that he wants me to buy a new car. Uh, I, I know that I made a promise to be faithful to my spouse, but uh, shucks, God is pulling me in a different direction. And, and those revelations from God would, at least with me, probably bear an uncanny resemblance to the desires of my own heart. Um, just like Israel in the days of the judges, when everyone did as they saw fit, following the depravity of their own hearts, talking about God all day long. It's, it's hard to listen to God, to be the servant. Just ask Samuel. But you don't have to ask Samuel. You know how hard it is when God's clear morality stands in contradiction to your own desires. But don't get out the earplugs. Suppress the message. Ah, who is that talking? I don't think it's God. Before you get out the earplugs, remember why God speaks. It's not because he's against you. It's because he's gracious. It's because he loves you. Can we picture it like this? What if you got lost deep inside a cave? No, dar no light, pure darkness, pure darkness. At first, you're, you're just scared to death and you're panicking. But then the adrenaline runs its course and you calm down and you get used to it. And, and not used to it in the sense that you can see in the dark. No, you get used to it in the sense that you love the dark. You love the dark because you know what happens in the dark? You can imagine yourself and everything else however you want it to be. Do you see how you could fall in love with darkness? And then if a rescue team closes in and you see just the faintest bit of life, light shimmering off the walls of the cave, then, then that scares you. And you're like, oh, light, bad! And and you scurry down further into the darkness. You're your own worst enemy. And it's not going to end well. But God doesn't leave you to grope about in darkness. When you open up your Bible where God promises to speak to you, that's light. That's pure light. And when God's goodness runs counter to the desires of your own depravity, when it, when it shines the light on you and shows you your sin, it hurts. The truth can hurt. But that doesn't mean the truth is bad. God's showing you your need to be rescued. And he shows you more than that. Not just how to find the light. It's not just a, a do-it-yourself rescue plan out of darkness. It's not just directions to the light. You open up the Bible and you listen to God's voice. That is light. That's how God gives you Jesus what you never would have found inside of your own heart. 
That's where God gives you Jesus and, and shows you that he's already rescued you, that Jesus loves you, that he died for you, that he rose for you, that he forgives you, that he has a love for you that never quits. And he loves to tell you that again and again because that's how he makes you his and that's how he keeps you his. That's where Samuel's prayer comes in. That we might always pray like Samuel. Speak, Lord, to me. You're my Lord, and I'm your servant. And speak, Lord, because your servant is listening. Amen.